Okay, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, thanks to the organizers, Stefan, uh, Christian, and Thomas, who they really do a, a great job for, uh, for Geneva. So I'm going to talk today about uh, water scarcity and local conflict. So that's actually an excellent transition, you know, your, your last point. Is that actually I'm going to highlight the fact that water scarcity is considered a very important factor uh, you know, behind social conflict and violent clashes. But people fight for water, but as you mentioned, sometimes people use water as a way to nurture bigger conflict. So water scarcity has an impact on, or, you know, over many conflicts, uh, more than the one uh, which are usually reported. So that's actually the point I'm going to make today. So as we know, there is a rise of, you know, local conflict over water. And uh, I will assess here in this talk from a more quantitative point of view, uh, you know, to what extent water scarcity uh, generate local conflicts, focusing on sub-Saharan Africa over a period of 20 years. Okay, so the idea is to try to highlight if there is a systematic effect of water scarcity on local conflict. So for those of you who know this institute, so the Pacific Institute is actually one of the leading institutes working on, on you know, water scarcity and, and conflict. And they gather data on reported water conflict. And what we see recently, if you, if you follow this curve, right there, I cannot show them directly on the board, but if, if, you, if you take a look at the, at the right side of the graph, what you see is that you have recently an increase in the number of reported water conflict. So, for example, it's something like 25 events in, in 2011. But of course, the point is that there is that's only you know water riots, water conflict. But there is certainly far more conflicts which may be triggered by water scarcity for you know other reason, institutional reason. And we think that this conflict triggered by water scarcity should be taken into account because the, it's really a cost of water scarcity that should be taken into account when crafting policies water management policies, for example. So this main idea here is that basically, you know, scarcity of, of a renewable resource, say water, for example, in combination with other institutional factors, you know, for that I will mention later on, trigger violent outcome, such as, you know, ethnic clashes and insurgencies. So the main point is that water scarcity by itself is not always you know, the main cause of violence, but it's, it's a trigger of underlying violence, of underlying tensions. So we should understand these underlying tensions, and then we should see water scarcity as a, as a trigger of these events. Okay, I think that's the right way uh, to analyze the type of results that I will present right now. So just as a, you know, as a wrap up, why you know, water scarcity may be a trigger of, of bigger events? If the fight is not for water directly, why people, you know, fight after after a water shock, after water stress? So, just you know, the most recent data we, we have, but of course we should be extremely uh, extremely cautious with these data, as, as David mentioned, uh, is that 60% of the of the population in sub you know sub-Saharan region is 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 farming. So it represents a third of the GDP of of the whole uh, region. So 95% of cropland are rain-fed. Only 5% are irrigated. Meaning that the main, what I want to convey as an intuition is that uh, a water stress has a direct impact on uh, agricultural output and an agricultural income. Okay, and it represents a huge part of the income of, of the region. So the idea is that drought can cause large reduction in agricultural income. And we know that sudden impoverishment of, of population is actually a, 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 you know, a, a well-known and strong trigger of conflict. So that's one way through which water scarcity can, can you know, trigger, trigger violence. Of course, it can also lead to increase in food prices in urban areas. Okay? A drought means less agricultural production, means increase in food prices in, in, in urban areas, which means that it has an effect also for, for urban dwellers, and it can create tension in the city as well. That's what we observe. It can increase competition over water and land. So it can create tensions among different users. So we can think of you know, farmers and elders sharing a common resource, or you know, nomads and settlers, or city dwellers and, and, and farmers. So all these groups share a common resource, which is water. And when the water, you know, the, the resource is dwindling, 
then tensions explode. And of course, water scarcity by itself threatens uh, you know, food security and livelihood. So all these mechanisms may explain how water scarcity can translate into conflict. So as I mentioned at the very beginning, I, I, I will just present to you some, some broad evidence. Okay, it's policy, you know, this, uh, this uh, evidence-based policy uh, type of thinking that we should use data sometimes to highlight some, some patterns in order to, to take you know, uh, decisions based on statistics, even if, if we should be extremely careful with that, as David mentioned. So what we do here is that basically we focus on, on 40 uh, sub-Saharan countries over you know, the period 1990 to uh, 2011. So we look at you know, monthly observation, meaning that uh, you know, we have an observation each month over, over this whole period. And actually the geographic unit that we consider is small grid, small cell, so it's not a country, it's some national cells, which are you know, 50 kilometers per 50 kilometers. And for each of these cells, we have information on riots. So we know if in a month a riot started, okay, or ended, and where it started. And we also have information on, on water scarcity. So we use a drought index, you know, use climatology, for example, to try to relate water scarcity with the emergence of, of riots. So that's what most of this research in political science and economic for the quantitative side is doing right now. So for those who like maps, here's, here's the maps actually. So that's all the riots event over the old period. It's around 2,000 of them. Okay, there is some clusters in Rwanda, in Kenya, in West Africa, South Africa. Okay, so that's all the events over the old period. And we try to relate these events with water scarcity. So as I mentioned, we use a drought index. So for example, in this map here, the kind of the area which are reddish, more red, characterize area in which there is less water than usual. Okay, and this area which are bluish characterize area in which there is uh, actually more water than usual. And the objective here, in a statistic sense, is to see if this variation in water availability explains the emergence of riots. Okay. So as David mentioned. We all know that you know, Mark Twain said that there is three types of lies. There is lies, dime lies, and statistics. And that holds true for, for this study as well. Is that of course the way we extract information is, is as important as the information itself. So it's very important to understand what we are highlighting here. So what's important is that we know in statistics that correlation, the fact that you know, extreme weather variation correlates with the emergence of a riot, doesn't mean that one is creating the other, okay? So we have to account in a statistical sense that I won't get too much into that, but for those of you interested by the methodology, you know, I'm happy to talk about it afterwards. We have to account for, uh, you know, for many variables that may explain both riots and be correlated with weather variation. So that's what this research is doing. Okay, that's what we do in political science, in economics, uh, when we use data. We try to control for as many things as possible that may explain both riots, violence, and weather variation. So the topology, the geography, if it's far from the capital, close to the capital, presence of natural resources. We try to account for seasonality, price of commodities, you know, all these things that may explain violence. And of course, quality of the institutions, political size, uh, cycle underlying tensions, presence of different ethnies in a cell, etc., etc. So accounting for all that, what do we find? Is there an effect of water scarcity on violence? The answer is yes. Okay, if when you have a drought in a cell, so in a specific region in Africa, in a month, you have actually an increase in the likelihood of having a riot with, by the magnitude of 10%. So you have 10% more chance to have a riot in a specific area, okay, after a drought, a drought of a specific magnitude. So the effect is actually it's a systematic and strong effect. Magnitude is in line with what other research are, are finding, and it's actually an important effect. So it's something that should be taken account into account while you know thinking about water management policies. It has a strong impact on local conflicts. This effect increases with population density. 
So when you, we are in area in Africa in which actually there is, uh, there is more population, population is more dense, then this, this effect, you, you increase the probability of having a riot after a drought by 25%. So it's becoming very important. Very, you know, it's becoming a strong driver actually of local violence. So for those interested, we do, you know, other type of analysis, trying to relate, you know, if uh, having, for example, you know, different ethnic group which are in competition with each other in a specific area may explain the emergence of a conflict after water scarcity. The answer is yes, and the effect is actually seven times bigger than in other area. So yes, ethnic competition explains is a, is a strong driver of conflict in times of water scarcity. And uh, the effect is even more true when there is very few water to begin with. So that's the main result of this research. And many other papers in this literature are finding very similar effect. So water scarcity is an important driver of conflict, but not only water conflict, other type of conflict. And all scarcity matters in a statistical, a statistical sense. So we do case study trying to understand better in qualitative study to understand what's going on. But in a statistical, statistical sense, the link is clear. So what should we do? And I will end with that. So we know that we highlighted the fact that there is kind of a competition for water. Water scarcity increase, you know, competition between different groups, and that may explain the emergence of conflicts. So what should we do? in order to reduce the link between water scarcity and conflict. So there is some, let's say, some way to deal with this. There is many ways, but here's the most obvious to me. The, the first, uh, of course, uh, aspect is one that is already adopted in, 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 in many countries in Africa, but also in, in Europe and, and the US. It's actually the role of adap adaptation, trying to adapt you know, our agriculture to, uh, to more extreme weather variation. If we expect climate change to, uh, to, to increase uh, water scarcity in the future. There is a role, of course, for insurance mechanism. So the idea here is that if conflict increase after water scarcity due to some you know, income drop, so the agricultural income dropping, then if after water scarcity some insurance mechanism, it can be a public insurance, of course, can be pure redistribution, but it can be you know, private insurance kicking in and try to sustain income of farmer after a difficult event. It may, it may weaken the link between, between water scarcity and, and, uh, and, and conflict. Okay, so many, many states right now are interested in implementing, for example, weather indexed crop insurance. International transfers contingent on, on climate risk indicators are also, uh, you know, it's explanatory uh, time of exploratory way to, to deal with the problem. And finally, of course, we have to deal with the most important thing, the role of institutions. So uh, the role of, uh, you know, water sharing agreement, the type of institutions that are put into place in each country to deal with management of common good. It's a very important area of research right now. And we investigate as well here in Geneva the role of land grabbing, which may increase potentially the effect of uh, water scarcity and conflict by putting into place some type of, uh, of crops which are more uh, water intensive than traditional crops. And the role of many other natural resources. I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>